Let's face it, chocolate is a lie. I mean, not everything we call chocolate is real chocolate. There are regulations that can help understand what you're eating. So it can either be chocolate or compound chocolate, which tastes great too, by the way. The main thing about real chocolate is that it's made of cocoa mass and cocoa butter. If the packaging reads cocoa powder and vegetable fat, sorry, it's only compound chocolate. The real one should contain at least 35% cocoa solid and about 18% cocoa butter. So if you have these two variations and try them at the same time, you'll probably find the compound one a bit tastier as it has various flavorings. And no wonder compound chocolate seems to be way more popular than the real type. First off, it's cheaper. Also, it's easier to store as it tends not to melt at room temperature. Right, so what about white chocolate? Is it real or compound? Actually, it's neither. It's not even related to chocolate. While compound chocolate has cocoa particles, white chocolate has zero. Yep, it has cocoa butter, but it's a bit different. The cocoa butter doesn't give it its signature flavor. Also, real chocolate contains certain compounds that trigger our brains, making us happy. As you might have guessed, white chocolate can't do the same. Any Nutella fans in here? We all know it's hazelnut cocoa spread, but have you ever wondered how many nuts each jar contains? The company once provided official info on it, stating that each jar contains about 50 hazelnuts. That may seem a lot, but it only makes up about 13% of the whole content. Sugar and palm oil take first place, making up 50% of all the content of Nutella. Fun fact here, the original recipe was way more nutty. Nutella was inspired by Gianduya, the traditional Piedmont recipe. It was changed several times over the last couple of centuries. At the end of the 18th century, it was a blend of chocolate with 30% hazelnut paste. Ah, and it had several interpretations. This early Nutella prototype could be used as a filling for chocolates, or even eaten in the form of bars. The mid-20th century interpretation had a whopping 71.5% of hazelnuts and only about 19.5% of chocolate. Now moving on to another global commodity. I'm talking about coffee. First things first, let's debunk one myth. There's no 100% decaffeinated coffee. Any coffee that has at least 97% caffeine removed is already considered to be decaf. By the way, there are a couple of different ways of removing caffeine. The first method involves a special solvent. The coffee beans are washed in it, and once the caffeine is removed, the solvent gets washed off. The second method, called the Swiss water process, involves carbon dioxide or a charcoal filter. Now here's a fun fact, your morning coffee is stewed fruit. Coffee beans are a berry pit, so it's basically a drink made of berries. Now for a bit of heartbreaking math. Imagine that you have a bag of nachos or chips and it costs you $10. Do you know how much you've paid for your snack? Only about $1.40. Where are the $8.60 then? You paid for the air in the bag. Research revealed that there's a brand selling mostly air and very few chips. Don't worry, not all the bags are that air packed, but still, there's always way more air than snacks. Instant noodles may not have any hidden lies, but they have a pretty cool story. Let's kick off with myth debunking. They say instant noodles were invented in Japan, but it's not so. The modern variation is for sure Japanese, but the very first ancient prototype was invented in China. Those were noodles that were fried and then served in soup. There's a legend telling that a chef put the already cooked noodles to boil again. To rescue them, he took them out of the pan and fried them in hot oil. The modern Japanese version was invented to prolong its food shelf life. After several unsuccessful attempts, Momofuku Ando, the inventor, came up with a method of preserving noodles. They were processed in various ways. They were steamed, dehydrated, fried in hot oil, and seasoned. In the beginning, instant noodles were considered to be a luxurious product, since they cost way more than the fresh noodles everyone was used to. We all love lemonade, 
and there are many variations of this drink. Today, pink lemonade has that nice color because of grape juice or added colorants. There are two legends of how it was invented, both of them featuring circus workers. The first story alleges that Henry Allot, who worked in a circus, unwittingly dropped a few red cinnamon candies in the lemonade, which gave that vibrant pink color. Another story is a bit gross, claiming that Pete Conklin, who was a circus worker too, one day ran out of water for lemonade and used the water from the tub where one of his colleagues had washed her red stockings. They faded and colored the water pink. Pete added some sugar, slices of lemon, and tartaric acid. He called it strawberry lemonade. The customers liked it a lot, and his sales doubled. Ugh. Sorry to break it to you, but nachos aren't some ancient Mexican food. They were invented less than 100 years ago. Ignacio Anaya, nicknamed Nacho, is said to have invented this dish in the 1940s. There's a nice story behind nachos. A regular customer got hungry and asked if Ignacio could bring her and her three friends something different that day. He saw how hungry the ladies were and decided to cook something quick for them. He had to improvise using available ingredients. So he got some tortillas, grated loads of cheese on top of them, and heated the dish from above. To make the dish more savory, he added some jalapeno peppers on top. Mamie Finnan, that very regular customer, asked what was the name of that unusual snack. Ignacio didn't think long and said the name was Nacho Special. The family of citruses has more intricate love stories than any rom-com. It actually reminds me more of a soap opera, like Dynasty. It may seem that an orange is a mandarin's dad, probably due to their sizes. But in reality, it's quite different. Limes and lemons aren't half-brothers either. They have way more differences than just the color. Grapefruit always seem to be a sort of outcast of the family, and we'll talk about them too. Sweeties and palmellos seem to be those distant relatives you hardly ever see. So, here's their family tree. The orange is the son, oops, the hybrid of a palmello and a mandarin. It's about 25% of the palmello genome and about 75% of the mandarin one. Grapefruit is a hybrid of sweet orange and palmello. Lemons may seem all independent, but in reality, they're just another hybrid between bitter orange and citron. And yeah, the lime we eat is hybrid too. In the wild, there are various evergreen trees of different types whose fruits we may call limes, but we mostly eat cultivated ones. Actually, there are many more distant citrus relatives you've never even heard of, like tangelo. Not hard to guess that it's a cross of a tangerine and a palmello, or orangello, a cross between a grapefruit and an orange. An almond is often mistaken for a nut. A nut should be dry, yet almonds have a fleshy layer. While growing on a tree, they look like a peach. So when you open it, you see a seed inside the inedible fleshy layer. And this is the almond we all know. If a strawberry fast food milkshake sounds like a safe and pretty healthy option for you, you might want to reconsider it. According to research, a regular strawberry milkshake may have about 59 ingredients in total. Thing is, it's pretty hard to recreate the original strawberry flavor, and it requires many ingredients to do so. There's a good reason the checkout lines are so tight. Let's say you're waiting there, and after you take one more look at your cart, you see there are certain things you don't really need, so it would be better not to buy them. So you're looking around trying to find a spot to leave them somewhere aside. Good luck with that. Checkout lines are designed like this, so you can't find a place to put these items down. So you make the subconscious decision to buy all these things after all. Take a closer look at your cart before getting there, or just stick to the list to avoid this. Also, the checkout line is probably the most tempting part of the supermarket. All those candies, shiny magazines, gums, and cool gadgets are there to grab your attention while you're patiently waiting your turn. Many people just automatically grab something from there while waiting, 
even though they weren't planning to buy it in the first place. Have you ever seen someone in front of the supermarket washing the shopping carts? Of course not, because no one does it. Yep, shopping carts are really filthy. So many people touch them during just one day, let alone this whole time they have been in the store. It would be good to wash your hands every time after shopping, or you can wipe the handle down before using it. You'll see some stores have wipes right next to the entrance. Spraying water makes fruits and vegetables look pretty. Plus, it adds weight to them, so you might end up paying more for them. These are the two actual reasons why workers spray them with water. No one does it to keep them fresh. Plus, spraying water won't keep fruit and vegetables fresh. It will just make them rot more quickly. Spraying water on them or not, wash all the fresh fruits and vegetables you buy. You know how you sometimes like to pick up a pear or a peach to see if they're ripe enough and put them back down if not? Well, you're not the only one who thought of that, so stick to washing your hands every single time you come back from the store. Check out the packages of fruits, vegetables, and meat you're buying. Even though you have to be prepared, you won't be able to see everything that's inside. One Reddit user took a picture of bacon so others can see what the visible slice looks like versus the rest of those packed in a way you can't see them well. Another user shared an interesting trick to help them feel how much meat a pack of bacon actually has. And this only works at low temperatures. So the fatty bits become stiffer before the meat does when the bacon is cold enough. That way, if you pick a cold pack of bacon that's kind of stiff and hard to bend, you have one full of fat. If you feel it's kind of squishy and you're able to fold it in half relatively easy, it means there's more meat and less fat. Here's one more interesting Reddit catch. It's not a hack supermarkets use. It's more like a bonus on your vegetables. A whole new ecosystem on your veggies. It's for those situations when you want some extra flavors but are running out of ideas. Fish you buy in supermarkets is often mislabeled. When it comes to meat, it's pretty lax with testing because you can tell the difference between, let's say, pork and beef relatively easily but it's harder to do it with fish. Some studies showed that a third of all fish on the market is not labeled properly. That means some expensive pieces such as salmon are replaced by other fish that look similar. The majority of that counterfeit fish is safe to eat, but there are some of it, such as snake mackerel, that can cause not so pleasant stomach issues. Don't trust expiration dates so blindly either. Of course, there's a certain number of weeks milk can remain good after packaging, but supermarket meat departments are a different story. They do their labeling there with their own devices, which means regulations are not that strict. In other words, if an item is about to expire, but it still looks good, supermarkets can simply put a new label on it. That means they can extend the expiration date for a couple of days, sometimes even more than a week. If possible, look for the food at the time when it first comes to the shelves, or find some trusted butcher nearby. But if you stumble upon meat or something else that's about to expire or has already passed the due date, you can negotiate for a better price. Just show the product to the staff, and in most cases, they'll be willing to lower the price. They'll probably have to put it on the discount anyway, so this way, it's just easier for them and better for you. So always check the expiration date. Pay attention to this because supermarkets mostly won't get shut down after they fail an inspection. Inspections are way more focused on restaurants, so you're more likely to hear a restaurant closed because they fail health standards rather than a grocery store. So going to a small local bakery instead of buying supermarket bread and generally trying smaller local businesses might not be a bad idea. These guys usually care a lot about their reputation. This hack grocery stores use is not so gross, but it's still worth knowing. They mostly place expensive stuff at eye level. Most of the population is right-handed, so most of us do the same movement reaching for stuff we want to buy. So things that will bring supermarkets the most profit are right there at eye level, front and center. 
Sometimes there will even be some additional colorful markups on these more expensive products that will make you buy them before even checking the others. So look to the side and look up to find better deals. Don't just grab the first thing that gets into your visual field. Also, things that are geared towards kids are placed a little bit lower, so they're at eye level too. One Redditor shared a photo from one supermarket where they had to cut out the bottom of laundry baskets so shoplifters don't fill them up and walk out. Another commentator said this is just a display version. That way, if you want to make a purchase, employees will go to the back room and send the basket to the registers for when you're ready to pay. It feels so exciting when you're going through those colorful newspaper inserts with special discounts. But they don't make these to save you money. Their main purpose is to make you buy things you don't really need, but you'll get them anyway because you believe they're on sale. Double check all the coupons you're about to use. Sometimes the special price they advertise is the same as the regular price without the coupon. Bulk buying deals might sound great at first, but they can be a trap. First, the price difference between individual products and those in bulk doesn't have to be that big. And you might end up buying way more stuff than you need. That means that either you'll buy too much so the items might go bad before you have a chance to use them, or you might eat and drink way more than you usually would. And neither of these options sounds good, and it's definitely not saving money. For example, one Reddit user noticed there's a pack of four blades instead of five, even though the price is the same and they haven't even changed the packaging. Check the prices of packages considering their weights too. One Redditor shared a photo of their catch, which might be tasty, but also quite expensive considering the size of the package. They usually shop for groceries online, and since this week was pretty stressful, they were tired and didn't check how tiny this block of cheese was. Over 100 years ago, an 11-year-old boy left his drink on a porch during a cold night. The glass was filled with powdered soda dissolved in water and a stirring stick to mix it up. 20 years later, Frank Epperson, that very forgetful boy, presented his accidental invention, the Popsicle, in a California park. There's no record of the original Popsicle flavor, but among the very first were cherry, the most popular one, lemon, orange, banana, watermelon, grape, and even root beer. Chocolate chip cookies are somewhat younger than Popsicles, having been invented in the 1930s. Ruth Wakefield, the owner of a popular restaurant named The Toll House Inn, is considered to be the inventor of these scrumptious cookies. There are various stories behind this invention. One story claims that Ruth ran out of baker's chocolate and decided to replace it with some basic semi-sweet chocolate, expecting it would melt completely. But it didn't. Another story says some chocolate just accidentally fell into the batter. Ruth denied the accidental origin of her cookies, claiming that it was all done deliberately. There are many legends behind the creation of the potato chip. One claims they were invented in 1853 by a chef at a luxurious New York restaurant. French fries were one of the specials at this restaurant, and people seemed to love them. But there was one customer who wasn't satisfied with the quality, complaining they were too thick. When the chef, George Crumb, <laughs> not crummy at all, cooked thinner French fries, the picky customer complained again. George deliberately made his next batch of fries paper thin. These fries were so thin, it was impossible to eat them with cutlery. Surprisingly, the finicky eater loved the dish. The chips recipe spread, and within a few decades, potato chips could be found in all the American grocery stores, turning from a hot dish to a fast snack. Worcestershire sauce is another product that wasn't invented deliberately. Two English chemists, John Willie Lee and William Henry Perrins, simply forgot about some barrels in the pharmacy basement for a couple of years. The first mixture they had made was totally inedible due to super strong flavor. But when they forgot some barrel of the mixture in the basement, it became fermented. 
When the chemists rediscovered the barrels and were curious to try it, they found that the taste had mellowed. This condiment is now used to intensify even those dishes that originally didn't have it. For example, chili con carne. Worcestershire sauce is part of the fifth flavor, umami, or savoriness, which explains its rich taste. Tofu, or bean curd, was invented centuries ago. One of its origin theories is that tofu was first created by a Chinese prince. Another theory claims that tofu appeared as a result of mixing boiled ground beans and sea salt. The salt was quite impure and probably contained calcium and magnesium. These ingredients let the bean mixture produce its curd-like consistency. One more legend says that some nigari, a sort of evaporated sea salt, was accidentally dropped into soy milk. Today, doctors tell you to stay away from Coca-Cola, but it was surprisingly invented by John Pemberton, who had a medical degree and was a pharmacist. Pemberton's French wine coca was initially used as a remedy for severe pains, headache, and as a nerve tonic. In 1886, a prohibition law was introduced, and John had to change the recipe to remove the alcohol. One thing was left unchanged, though, the cola nut that gave the drink its trademark flavor. Some legends say that John only accidentally added carbonated water to the new recipe. But in fact, he knew exactly what he wanted to do. Pemberton thought bubbles were a savory alternative to alcohol. John's cola is definitely the Coke precursor, but today's drink differs from the original Pemberton's recipe. The sandwich was invented by accident, too. Back in the 1700s, John Montague, the fourth Earl of Sandwich, ordered his valet to make him a simple dish that could be eaten with no cutlery at all. He asked the valet to tuck some meat in between two loaves of bread. Lord Sandwich was particularly addicted to playing cards, and this dish let him eat without stopping the game. The cards didn't get greasy, either. People started asking to bring the same as sandwich to their games, and soon the dish had its common name. The tomato ketchup we ate today is such a modified version that it actually has nothing to do with original ketchup recipe. You can trace its roots back to the 17th century, when the Chinese mixed pickled fish and spices, calling it a word that sounded a bit like ketchup, and which meant the brine of pickled fish. The English first tried this sauce about 100 years later. The British version featured mushrooms, shallots, and even walnuts. Later, the word ketchup changed its meaning and could be used for any dark-colored sauce. The first tomato ketchup had anchovies among its ingredients, which hints back to its relation to the Chinese fish sauce. Nachos aren't some ancient Mexican food. They were invented less than 100 years ago. Ignacio Anaya, nicknamed Nacho, is said to have invented this dish in the 1940s. Ignacio was a chef, and one day a regular customer asked if Ignacio could bring her and her three friends something different as a snack. He saw how hungry the ladies were and decided to cook something quick for them. He had to improvise using available ingredients. So he grabbed some fried tortillas, grated loads of cheese on top of them, and heated the dish from above. To make the dish more savory, he added some jalapeno peppers on top. The very regular customer asked the name of the unusual snack. Ignacio didn't think long and said, Nacho Special. Cheese puffs used to be a waste product in the 1930s. Edward Wilson noticed some oozing corn in one of the machines at a factory that produced flake food for animals. Those ribbons seemed interesting, so Edward decided to take them home and try to season them. He also noticed that the puffy corn hardened if it was exposed to air. The experiment turned out to be a success, so it was later developed into a world-famous snack. Now, instant noodles weren't invented by mistake, but there were several mistakes while inventing them. The main idea was to create something with a long shelf life. After several unsuccessful attempts, Momofuku Ando invented the method of preserving the noodles. They were processed in various ways, like steamed, dehydrated, fried in hot oil, and seasoned. And instant noodles used to be a luxury product, since they cost way more than the fresh noodles everyone was used to. Another product that was invented unwittingly is yogurt. It first appeared in Central Asia thousands of years ago. 
Some herders stored milk in a place with an abundance of bacteria without knowing it. The milk was fermented, and it resulted in a thicker texture and flavor change. One of the herders wasn't scared of that kind of dish and tried it. Nothing bad happened to him, so other people started eating it too. Today, pink lemonade has that nice color because of grape juice or added colorants. But there are two legends of how it was invented, and both feature circus workers. The first story alleges that Henry Allot, who worked in a circus, unwittingly dropped a few red cinnamon candies in the lemonade, which gave it that vibrant pink color. The other story is gross. It claims that circus worker Pete Conklin one day ran out of water for lemonade and instead used the water from the tub where one of his colleagues had washed her red stockings. The color of the pants turned the water pink. Pete added some sugar, slices of lemon, and acid. He called it strawberry lemonade. The customers liked it a lot, and his sales doubled. Yes, the people were panting for the stuff. The tartatatin, which is a caramelized, upside-down version of an apple pie, was cooked for the very first time by mistake. Two sisters, Stephanie and Carolyn Tatton, ran a hotel in the 1800s. One day, Stephanie wanted to cook a simple apple pie. But she stewed the apples in butter for too long. To conceal her mistake, she put the crust on top of the apples and put it in the oven. When she took the pie out of the oven, she noticed several burn marks. It was a bad cooking day. She didn't want the guests to notice, so she flipped the pie over and presented it as a brand new recipe. Surprisingly, the guests just loved the pie, which soon became their signature dessert. Okay, gotta go. I'm really hungry. The national Jamaican fruit, ackee, has a truly unique taste. It's mild and buttery, and people who tried it say it tastes just like scrambled eggs. It's safe to eat ackee only as long as it's fully ripe. So the import of raw ackees was banned in the U.S. almost 50 years ago. The only edible part is the white, creamy flesh itself. The pink flesh looks mouthwatering, but don't fall for it. It's highly toxic. Same with the black seeds. Soursop is one more fruit banned from the U.S. because of its toxins. It's also referred to as guanabana and can release toxic substances, leading to some very unpleasant effects if not ripe. Soursop fans, don't be sad. Chances are you might find some frozen pulp in supermarkets. Another thing that should be 100% ripe to be safe is elderberry. Raw elderberry is rich in vitamin C, which is good for you and cyanide, which is not that good. These berries are quite popular, though. You can find them in pies, syrups, teas, jams, you name it. Fully ripe and cooked berries aren't dangerous. And nope, it's not banned. Cyanide doesn't seem that serious when it comes to food with tetrodotoxin, which is 1,200 times stronger. Pufferfish is a Japanese delicacy, and it's loaded with the substance. No person can eat this fish without consequences, but Japanese chefs have mastered their skills to perfection. To make it edible, they simply remove the poisonous parts. This delicacy is called fugu and costs about $200 per portion. You could buy a whole bunch of totally safe salmon instead. It's almost completely banned in the US. There are only a few authorized places that sell it, but you probably don't feel like having such a gastronomic adventure either way. Kasu marzu literally means rotten cheese. Sorry, you can't try a bite of it in the U.S., so in case you can't resist the temptation, just head to the island of Sardinia, Italy. In fact, it's just sheep milk cheese with a pinch of, mm, let's say, magic. Special flies leave their eggs right inside that cheese, and they stay there for 40 days. At the moment it's ready for consumption, this cheesy delicacy has some live maggots taking care of decomposing it. Thanks to them, the cheese has that distinctive texture and spicy flavor. It's banned in the U.S. for sanitary reasons. Unlike soft and creamy Kasu Marzu, the Himalayan cheese Chirpy is famous for being the world's hardest. Just like any regular product of this type, it's made from milk. What makes it different is that it stays fresh for up to 20 years. The milk is quite special, too. The cows, which are actually a cross between cows and yaks, eat a variety of mountain herbs. 
This milk has a unique flavor, thanks to those herbs. But be careful with your teeth, nibbling on that hard as stone cheese. In Singapore, you'll never have cavities because of chewing gum. And nope, it's not because they take care of your teeth. The thing is, it's completely illegal there. This place is known for its cleanliness, and the country spent a fortune cleaning all the spots and banning chewing gum. It was prohibited back in 1992, and vendors had to stop the sales immediately to avoid super high fines. Walking down the supermarket aisles while traveling to different destinations, you may spot that there's no raw milk in stock. It's prohibited in many US states and other countries, including Canada, Norway, Finland, Sweden, Denmark, and Scotland for sanitary reasons. While raw milk is a no-go for Scotland, haggis is completely fine there. Still, it's banned in the US. If you live in the States and you're under 45, chances are you've never tried haggis since it was prohibited almost half a century ago. This Scottish pudding is made of a full range of sheep's inner parts, mixed with some oatmeal and spiced up with a bunch of minced onions. Oh, and don't forget suet and some broth. The texture is crumbly and coarse, and no surprise, the dish is quite spicy. It's usually served with mashed potatoes or mashed turnip. Cassava is a poisonous tropical root with two types. The sweet variation does contain some cyanide, but it's enough to cook it to reduce the toxic content to a non-toxic level. To get rid of all the toxins in bitter cassava, it's necessary to grate the root, then soak it, and finally cook properly to make it edible. This root is very starchy, and its flavor is really subtle. Cassava can be used just like potatoes, mashed, boiled, or fried. What do you think? How about some haggis with mashed cassava instead of potatoes on the side? By the way, harmless potatoes aren't that safe either. It all depends on whether it's ripe or not. So-called green potatoes are full of toxins, and potato sprouts are also quite unsafe. Same with green almonds and cashews, which are full of cyanide if not ripe enough. Luckily, the nuts we get at the supermarket are well-processed, which means they're completely safe. Yellow plums, or Mirabelle plums, are banned in all the 50 states of America. These fruits are completely fine, and nothing bad happens if you eat them. But you can only enjoy these plums in Lorraine, France. The importation law is a bit bizarre, and this fruit is of protected origin. If sea bass is the kind of dish you just can't live without, then the UK isn't your destination. This fish has been recently banned there because of declines in the sea bass population. The same goes with beluga caviar in the US. One of the world's most expensive foods can't be found in America because of new regulations protecting the fish. Hey, feel like a burger with freshly cooked meat, the softest bun, and loads of ketchup? Go and grab it, unless you're a French school student. There's a law in France regulating the use of ketchup in cafeterias for students and they're only allowed to have it with, you guessed it, french fries. Greenland shark bodies get rid of all the waste they produce, filtering it through their flesh and skin, so no wonder their flesh is toxic. Sounds like a fair reason not to eat them, but not in Iceland. Hakarl, which is processed shark meat, is first hung to dry for three to five months. In the end, you get something like ammonia-smelling fermented fish with the jelly texture that reminds you of wet bread. Some things get better with age, unless it's food. But there's one cafe in Bangkok where they've been cooking the same beef and noodle soup for 45 years. This potion-like soup has been simmering for over four decades. The broth has never been thrown away, and it's always kept overnight for the next day's servings. One of the secrets of the unique flavor is the massive grease rim around the pan that formed because they never washed it. Okay, now I've got the perfect excuse to do the same thing. What? The food just tastes better this way. In Cambodia, you can try a crunchy, crispy snack that tastes somewhat like a crab. It's deep fried and a bit seasoned. The main ingredient is a tarantula. Uh, this doesn't quite sound like a lunch. Okay, well, you wouldn't have guessed it if I hadn't told you. This soup that sounds like a tongue twister is definitely scrumptious. The flavor is sharp, yet delicate, and it tastes just like shrimp. Well, this traditional Laotian dish sounds really cool, 
until you realize it's made of ant eggs. To give it a bit of sourness, they also tend to add a few tiny ants. In Mexico, you don't throw away corn kernels that have turned black because they're rotten. You keep them as a culinary specialty called huitlacoche. Fungus all over the kernel give that earthy, woody smell. Yum, yum. Some dishes just need decoration, especially cakes and pies. In England, there's a pie called stargazy. The name speaks for itself. The sardines, accompanied by potatoes and eggs, peek out of the pie's crust and stare at the skies. And it looks a bit creepy. Sometimes it's the tails that point at the skies, though. Tea mushroom is another weird thing that they drink in Eastern Europe, together with acid milk-based drinks. It's basically some fermented black or green tea. It's made by adding a whole culture of bacteria. They're not consumed, they just ferment the drink. To sweeten tea, the sugar acts like yeast. Add juice, spice, or whatever you want to taste. Enjoy, or at least try to. Tuna eyeballs are quite a popular delicacy in China and Japan. They need to be boiled before eating, and some seasoning is required too. If you nail it, you'll have a delicacy that tastes like squid. And it costs less than a dollar. <laughs> I bet you're eyeing that one. You're about to go into an interview for your dream job. As you wait in the lobby, you realize you are so nervous in the morning that you forgot to eat breakfast. Now you're so hungry, you could eat a horse. Luckily, you are smart enough to pack some food in case you started starving. You open the bag of cheese puffs you brought, but then you realize, how are you going to eat these without getting cheesy orange dust all over your fingers and your nice outfit? Clever people on the internet have engineered the perfect genius solution. If you're not afraid of being a little unconventional, you can save your fingers from getting dust coated by using a pair of chopsticks. They're long enough to reach down into the bag, so you can keep your hand safely outside of the cheesy, dusty abyss. But when you were opening the bag, a tear appeared on its side. The more you move it, the more the tear grows. You have to be careful because any further, and your nice clothes will be covered in chip dust. Thankfully, the solution is just within reach. You spot a hole punch on the lobby desk. Using it, you can punch a hole in the bottom of the tear and stop it in its tracks. The round hole distributes force evenly, making a roadblock that helps prevent the bag from further ripping. Those tips are great, but they won't help you with the other chips you brought, which come in a tube. Luckily for that kind of packaging, all you need is a piece of printer paper. Curl it up and slip it into the tube around the chips. Now you can slide the entire stack out easily, opening the paper once it's out for a mess-free tray. As you're happily crunching away, you look around suddenly aware that you're being very loud. You need to make a good first impression here after all. Good thing science has some answers on how to be quieter when eating one of the crunchiest snacks of all. Press each chip against the roof of your mouth using your tongue. The softness of your tongue will help to suppress the crunching noise. Curved shaped chips are especially engineered to make the loudest crunch sound. So the best way to muffle the noise is to get rid of the shape first, then eat the chip as usual. But be warned, science has also claimed that eating your favorite crunchy snacks without hearing the iconic sound may mean you won't enjoy them as much. A professor of experimental psychology at Oxford University conducted a curious experiment. It showed that people's perception of flavor and taste are influenced not only by how food looks, but also by how it sounds. He had 20 participants eat chips while wearing headphones. He immersed their ears in crunching sounds at different volume levels and frequencies. Even though the chips they were munching on were all identical, the participants who were listening to louder, high-pitched crunches actually thought their chips were fresher and crispier. After all those salty snacks, you could go for a creamy treat through the window, you see there's an ice cream truck parked right outside. Perfect! You sneak a look at the clock. There's still plenty of time until your interview. Ice cream, here you come. You scan the menu on the truck. Obviously, a soft serve cone is way too risky. You can see it already. The slow drip melting down your hand right onto your nice clothes. Okay, no cone. So how about an ice cream sandwich? It's designed to keep you protected from sticky spills. And you're right, it is a good option. But there's a genius trick to make it even more foolproof. 
As you hold the sandwich, the soft cookie outside will warm up under your body heat, becoming tacky and sticky to your skin. We all know the chocolatey cookie goo that's left on our fingers, no matter how carefully we try to hold the sandwich as we eat. Adding a graham cracker on either side of the cookies will help you stay clean and pristine. Plus, it turns our regular ice cream sandwich into an upgraded cold s'more. It's an ice cream sandwich sandwich. As you're heading back inside, you spot another food truck, this one selling burritos. Well, you have lots of time and you're still pretty hungry. You order all your favorite fillings. When they hand you your order, you notice the burrito is wrapped in a second tortilla. This is a common, genius thing for restaurants to do. And while a lot of people don't know why, it can actually help you stay clean. While eating, unwrap the second tortilla and lay it open on a plate. Lean over it with each bite. Since burritos are notoriously good at dropping more of their filling than they keep in, this trick was devised to make the most of it. Anything that drops out will land on the second tortilla, which you can then wrap up into a second burrito when you're done with the first. This is the same reason packaged tortillas are often sold in even numbers. A delicious smell wafts from down the street. A stand selling corn on the cob. That pairs perfectly with a burrito. But there's no food that gets stuck in your teeth like corn. You didn't bring any floss, and it'd be so embarrassing to go into the interview with a yellow kernel in your teeth. Luckily, you can have your corn and eat it too. Just use a chopstick. Skewer the corn kernels with it, going horizontally along a row. Then use one hand braced against the cob and pull the other end away. You will have a stack of juicy corn that you can eat right off the stick, avoiding any fibers between your teeth. Genius! Back inside, you check the time. There's still plenty of it. And you've managed to stay completely clean and perfectly presentable for your interview. A fruit bowl sits on the receptionist's desk with a sign that says, complimentary. You grab a wonderfully ripe kiwi. But this is an office building, so there are no spoons lying anywhere. Plus, cutting the fruit open and scooping the middle out can get really juicy. That's no worry though, because that's not the only way of eating a kiwi. Some kiwi enthusiasts suggest that the best way is to actually eat the fruit whole, just biting into it like an apple. The kiwi fruit skin is completely edible and is packed with additional nutrients. A recent study shows that eating the skin can triple the fiber intake compared to just eating the flesh. Plus, this way, you're not losing out on the vitamin C boost that it can give. The skin contains high concentrations of nutrients, especially fiber, folate, and vitamin E. Supposedly, eating the skin of a kiwi can increase its fiber content by up to 50%. If you can't handle the fuzzy texture, try rubbing the fruit against a pair of jeans. The friction created by the denim will easily remove the fuzz, making the fruit much more palatable. Try it out! Not only will you be less likely to be sprayed with sticky juice, but you might also get more nutritious bang for your buck. Oh, wow. you just remembered that you packed a sandwich for lunch in the morning. Might as well have it now, but all that mustard and barbecue sauce there has to be a way to hold sandwiches to make sure they make the least mess, right? Good news, there is. Sandwiches are best eaten with a claw hand shape. Hold the burger so that your thumbs and pinkies are on the bottom, leaving your other three fingers over the top of the bun. This positioning works like a clamp, holding all the ingredients in place. This way, you can take bites without worrying about half of the sandwich ending up on your lap. Well, after all that food, you're thirsty. The coffee maker in the corner is calling your name, but bringing it back to your seat without a spill is a test of agility that only a person with perfect balance can manage. Actually, you just need to understand a bit of physics. Have you ever wondered why it's so hard to walk with a cup of coffee without spilling it? It's because the length of a person's stride has almost exactly the right frequency to create rolling waves in a typical sized coffee mug. Each step rocks the liquid more, and it gets closer and closer to the mug's lip. Spills are most common between your 7th and 10th steps. We often try to walk quickly with our cups so that we can get to our destination before it spills over. But it turns out that the faster you walk, the closer your gait comes to the natural sloshing frequency of coffee. 
to avoid creating the waves that lead to spillage, walk slowly. Finally, it's time for your interview. Good thing you've kept completely clean while eating. You head towards the meeting room. On a table right outside, there are free powdered jelly donuts for everyone. How nice! A donut would be the best after that cup of coffee. Uh Uh-oh, you're so distracted you don't notice your untied shoelace and go flying into the table. Donuts fly up and land right into your lap. So much for a good first impression. Many people try to store different types of food in the fridge, just in case. It seems like the smartest decision to extend a product's lifespan. But it's not that simple. For some foods, the fridge can be harmful. For example, sauces. If the package doesn't say otherwise, it's better to keep them outside the fridge. You can put them in a cupboard that is far from your oven to protect sauces from temperature changes. The worst enemy of coffee beans is moisture. Special oil in coffee beans is responsible for that pleasant and cozy coffee smell. When you place your coffee in the fridge, condensation changes its entire cell structure and makes all the magic disappear. But if your goal is to get off caffeine, maybe it is a good idea to store your beans in the cold. Rumor has it that honey is an immortal food. You can store it almost forever, but make sure to do it properly. Keep honey in a cold and dark place, but don't put it in your fridge. Otherwise, it may crystallize and lose some of its major beneficial properties. Putting tomatoes into the fridge seems pretty harmless, but it's not the best idea. It will make tomatoes lose their delicious flavor, because cold air slows down the natural ripening process. Thus, the thin membranes inside of the tomatoes get less juicy. And you don't want your salad to be watery and tasteless, do you? The best way to store tomatoes is in a well-ventilated box or basket at room temperature. If you want to keep sliced bananas from getting brown, use citrus juice. Just drizzle orange or lemon juice over the cut bananas. Unfortunately, this trick only works for a few hours. The perfect way to store your chocolate is inside your stomach. Dah, just kidding. Keep it away from the fridge and store it in a cool, dark place. This way, you don't only protect your dessert from your sweet tooth roommates, but also keep its attractive appearance. It's not a good idea to put your chocolate in the fridge because the temperature difference will create some condensed water on the surface of the chocolate bar and keeping it away from the fridge is safer for your teeth. Chocolate tends to harden at low temperatures, which makes each bite more difficult. Don't keep your hummus at room temperature. It doesn't matter whether it's homemade or pasteurized. In both cases, it's not safe. If the hummus is traditional and doesn't contain any preservatives, its lifespan is up to one week. As for unopened supermarket hummus, you can store it in your fridge for about three months and for one week once you've opened it. Let's say you've just baked the perfect cookies. It's time to put them in a jar or container. Unfortunately, the cookies will eventually lose that precious out-of-the-oven feel and keep getting harder and harder as the days go by. But if you add a slice of bread to that same container, the cookies will keep their soft texture for much longer. That's because cookies will absorb moisture from the bread. People usually wrap cheese in plastic packages, but this solution is far from perfect. Plastic wrap attracts too much moisture, which creates an ecosystem for mold to grow and prosper. If you want to protect your cheese from this bitter scenario, sprinkle it with vinegar. But don't use more than a few drops. Otherwise, it'll ruin the original taste of your cheese. After that step, wrap your cheese tightly in wax paper and put it in the fridge. There are no special rules about eggs. It's safe to store them both inside and outside the fridge, as long as their expiration date is fine. It's important to make sure the temperature is stable and consistent. If your choice is to put eggs in the fridge, don't keep them on the side shelf. To protect them from temperature fluctuations, put the eggs deeper in the fridge. Also, experts don't recommend removing the eggs from their package. These containers are actually meant to extend the lifespan of the eggs. Yes, the temperature is not equal all over your fridge. The shelves on the door are the warmest area, for example. And the closer the shelf is to the freezer, the lower the temperature gets. So, if you want to create perfect food distribution inside your fridge, don't skip the specific storage recommendations that are mentioned on some packages. If you store a loaf of bread in the supermarket package, get ready to see some mold in a couple of days. It's better to keep your bread in a firmly closed box with a little bit of salt. This tip will protect it from the mold. 
Also, avoid keeping bread in the fridge, because cold air will make it stale very quickly. But when you need to save bread for a long time, you can put it in the freezer. This way, it'll stay fresh for up to six months. If you want to keep sliced cucumbers from drying out, put them in an airtight container and pour fresh water in it. Don't store them in the fridge for more than a week. As for the whole cucumbers, keep in mind that they rot in the cold air way faster than at room temperature. If you want to keep them fresh for as long as possible, store them outside the fridge. Avocado is a tricky fruit with tricky storage rules. If your avocado is hard and not fully ripe yet, keep it away from the fridge because cold air will slow down the ripening process. Bananas emit high levels of ethylene, which helps avocados ripen faster. So if you want to accelerate the process, put it in a bag with one or several bananas. At the same time, if your avocado is soft and ripe, storing it in the fridge will keep it from going bad. Some people prefer wrapping cut avocado in plastic wrap together with a slice of onion. This tip helps the fruit to stay fresh longer. Another way is to cover it with olive oil. Keep in mind that cut avocado can be stored in the fridge for no longer than three days. Keep your onions and garlic away from the fridge. Low temperatures will cause mold way faster. If you want to keep them fresh for a long time, store them in a cool, dry place. For example, in the kitchen cupboard. And if you don't mind some country house style in your kitchen, tie the onions to one another and keep them hanging. Also, avoid storing oranges and other citrus fruits in the fridge. Unfortunately, low temperatures make these fruits less tasty and less beneficial for your health. You can store them in a fruit bowl on a shelf or kitchen table. Don't worry, this won't speed up their rotting. Just like many other vegetables, eggplants don't like low temperatures. In the fridge, they get soft and lose their good qualities way faster. Keep these veggies away from direct sunlight in some dry space at room temperature. If you've sliced an apple, but you don't want to eat it right away, here's a tip. Put a rubber band around the slices to hold them together. It'll keep the apple from turning brown. This fruit will stay fresh and crispy for as long as a whole month when stored in a moisture-resistant bag in a fridge. It's advised to avoid washing apples before storing them, as it might cause spoilage. Never put olive oil inside your fridge. If you've made this mistake before, you've probably noticed those weird white pieces inside the oil. Don't worry, it's not toxic. In fact, low temperatures in the fridge cause water condensation, which looks like unpleasant impurities. It's better to keep your olive oil at room temperature and far from direct sunlight. Watermelons and other melons kept at room temperature contain more beneficial nutrients and antioxidants compared to those kept in the fridge. But once you cut your watermelon, it's better to store it in the fridge. Use plastic wrap to cover the cut side tightly and replace it each time you cut your watermelon. Also, you can cut your melon or watermelon in smaller slices and store them in an airtight container in your fridge for up to one week. Freezing ginger will allow you to keep it fresh for two to nine months and maintain its quality. You can also grate it in advance so you can take one spoonful at a time. This will save you time, especially on those busy days when you need to prepare something fast. Flies are everywhere we go, literally. It's believed that flies originated in Asia, but these days, they live everywhere people live, only excluding Antarctica and maybe a couple of islands. Flies have traveled the oceans following humans, but they never go anywhere alone. In the wilderness and deserts where humans are absent, you won't find any flies. We know them well, but we all have that unanswered question about flies. Why do flies rub their limbs? Turns out, they just clean them. It's this simple. A fly has hair all over its body. The hairs on the limbs serve as detectors for flying, finding food, and doing whatever else the fly business is. They have to keep their limbs clean at all times. So, they just rub them every time they get a chance. Their limbs are sensitive, and they serve more than one purpose. Apparently, the limbs have taste receptors, so the flies can taste with their feet. They can land on their potential meal and wander around it, giving it a good taste before consuming it. Flies can't chew, so they're on an all-liquid diet and drink their food. If the food they have picked as their next meal is solid, 
they have a special ritual to make it edible. A fly regurgitates digestive juices on their soon-to-be food, and those juices break it into the smallest pieces that can be drunk. Also, spitting out those juices frees up space in their stomachs for new food. Quite often, flies sit on our food. They can appear harmless, but it's not exactly true. First, remember that they spill out those juices onto your food, which is already gross enough. But there's more. You have to keep in mind that flies land everywhere, and it's not always flowers, but all the gross stuff as well. And flies especially like that said gross stuff, like rotting foods, dumpsters, and even worse. So, their limbs collect all the germs and microbes from those places. When a fly lands on your food, it transfers those germs to your meal. Some of the microbes they transfer can even cause diseases like cholera and typhoid. There was even an experiment once made to demonstrate how it works. There were two bowls. One contained a red powder of some kind of spice and the other bowl had white rice in it. Flies were let in and they would migrate from the spice bowl to the rice bowl and back. Soon enough, rice got covered with red spice. Now, replace harmless spice with something grosser and rice with your dinner. So, you should always cover your food to make sure some fly doesn't take a walk on it and step and spit all over it. If you're eating, make sure you swat them away. But don't worry if some annoying fly manages to sit on your sandwich for a second before you kick it out. No need to throw the sandwich out. If you acted fast, then you're safe. Also, experts say that an average healthy human has a strong enough immune system to repel parasites. Even though flies are gross and annoying, bugging around and tickling you with their limbs, they do serve some good. They're responsible for pollinating flowers. They collect nectar from them, which gets stuck to their hair on their bodies. And then they pollinate the next flower when landing on it. Also, if flies didn't exist, our planet would be even dirtier. Flies recycle some of the human waste. Flies are also an important part of the ecosystem since they're food for birds, spiders, lizards, frogs, and many more. Without flies, they'd all go extinct. Apart from flies having the superpower of tasting with their feet, there are other interesting facts about them too. They can walk on both horizontal and vertical surfaces and even upside down. They can do it because each one of a fly's feet has two pads with tiny hair. And those hairs produce a glue-like substance that allows flies to have an excellent grip. Flies have unique eyes, which have a large complex of 3,000 to 6,000 simpler eyes within each of the two compound eyes. A fly's eyes don't move, but its vision is nearly 360 degrees. They can see behind their back. So, wherever you are, a fly definitely sees you and every other danger with one or a few of their thousands of monitors. In addition to the two compound eyes, flies also have three simple eyes located on their foreheads, which serve as a compass and allow a fly to navigate. They also have an amazing reaction time. Ever wondered why it's so hard to swat a fly? Well, to a fly, we're sloths. That's because they see things in slow motion compared to us. Species have different perceptions of speed. The speed we see will be twice faster for a turtle and it will be four times slower for a fly. Turn a video on at 0.25 times speed and imagine someone approaching you with this speed. Well, that's how a fly sees you. So yes, it has enough time to escape a fly has just one set of wings. But in addition to their pair of wings, they also have so-called halters, which allow them to take off fast. Millions of years ago, halters were serving as a second pair of wings. Now they help to take off and also to balance the air. If a fly loses one of the halters, it'll start flying in circles. And if both of them go missing, it won't be able to fly anymore at all. Also, even though their wings beat up to 1,000 times per minute, they're also very slow flyers, only reaching the speed of 4.5 miles per hour. If a fly lives in an urban area with enough people and garbage around, it doesn't fly far away from the place of residence, only having a territory of a bit over 3,200 feet. 
Rural flies are far more explorative, and they can fly away up to seven miles at a time. A fly doesn't live long. Its lifetime is just around 30 days. But during this time, they lay from 500 to 800 eggs each on average. But it's not 1,000 at once. It's several goes throughout their life, with 75 to 100 eggs at once. The eggs hatch within 24 hours, and it takes a week in total for an egg to turn into a grown fly. And then the cycle continues. In colder climates, this process can take twice as long. A timber fly is the biggest fly species, which lives in Central and South America. They can grow up to 3.15 inches. Also, flies have beds, or more like their favorite spot to stay and sleep. They have a comfy place, somewhere close to their source of food, and they come there to rest at night. If you ever had your house flooded with flies, here are a few tips for you to reduce their population. First, it's important to understand what they're attracted to. They're attracted to other flies and even to the smell of flies living there. And flies have an amazing sense of smell. So if you hosted even one fly, expect to get more guests. If you have any traces of flies, like fly specks, they'll find you too. Make sure to wash your walls and surfaces. Next, flies love garbage and rotting produce. They lay eggs in rotten food and meat, so make sure to keep your food in the fridge, cover it, and keep the trash in tightly sealed containers. And of course, take out the trash regularly. Flies have a sweet tooth, or more like a sweet foot, since they taste with their feet. And they love syrup and other sugary liquids. They're also fond of soda and vinegar. So make sure to keep those stored and always wipe after yourself if you spill something. Lastly, they like to hide and live in dirty and leaky drains. They eat the bacteria from there. So always clear your drains and repair any leaks right away. Also, it'll help to seal all the cracks in your floor, ceiling, and walls if you have any. That's one of their ways to get into the house. From the iconic golden fries to a broken ice cream machine, here are 10 fast food secrets that the fast food industry doesn't really want you to know. Ah, chicken nuggets. Those golden crispy bites you can get from fast food chains. They're even on the menu of school lunches. What if I tell you that they aren't actually made entirely out of chicken? Researchers took chicken nugget samples from unnamed fast food chains and analyzed them. They said that one sample, for instance, contained only 40% and another 50% of meat. The rest? Well, you're eating mouthfuls of things like fat, connective tissue, and bone spicules. Many fast food companies grind the meat with that stuff. They make mechanically formed orbs of chicken parts. Why? Perhaps it's because this method is cheaper and more profitable. Millions of restaurants worldwide have chicken nuggets on their menu. So, scientifically, it's not fair to say all nuggets are made this way, but a lot of studies imply so. The more the meat is processed, the more you lose the good stuff, like vitamin B6 and B12. The bitter truth is that companies add stuff, such as sodium, to the mixed paste. Sodium is added to get a better flavor. It's one of the ingredients that makes nuggets so yummy. Our bodies need sodium, but not too much of it. Unfortunately, most junk food contains more than our bodies can handle. So it might be a safe option to avoid eating these sorts of foods frequently. Chains dip their nuggets into tempura batter and fry them in hydrogenated oil. That's also not a green light regarding health, but this is how they catch the golden tint. They put additional stuff in nuggets. What about grilled chicken? In recent years, we've seen brands highlighting grilled chicken as a healthier option. Research has been done about grilled chicken too. And the same approach is applied here. Take chicken samples from iconic fast food companies and send those to labs for analysis. The results show that companies are misleading people by advertising these products by labeling them as healthy, natural, and 100% chicken breast. In reality, a couple of things are added to the meat to make it tender and juicy. Plus, these additives make it easier to cook the meat, freeze, and transport it, and reheat it later without losing too much moisture. The drawback of all these additives is that they affect the nutritional value of the chicken breast. These ingredients aren't the healthiest for us. We should especially watch out for three things. 
The first one is again sodium. Fast food samples had 7 to 10 times more sodium than home cooked chicken breast. Imagine you have a cheeseburger, but you say no to yourself and try to pick a less harmful menu item. Yet, some chicken sandwiches have the same amount or even more sodium than a cheeseburger with medium fries. The second thing you need to watch out for is phosphate additives. These additives allow the protein to conjoin more water. This means the white meat in the sandwich will appear juicier to you. Any word you see in the ingredients section that contains phos is a phosphate additive, so it's best to avoid them. The last thing you should avoid is sugars and starches, not just in grilled chicken, but pretty much in all fast food products. Oh, that's hard to digest, I admit. Cornstarch, sugar, malt, they come with grilled chicken breast. Buns and even some fries have sugar too. Everywhere I look, it's sugar. You see, home cooked chicken has zero grams of carbs, but the study samples had added sugar and up to 10% of the calories in the chicken breast comes from there. So what's the moral of this story? If you're a health conscious diner, you should maybe go for other options. There are secret recipes from companies like KFC and Coca-Cola. No company wants to share the ingredients that make their food irresistible, but with a little research, you can decipher many things. You want to know the secret of McDonald's fries? It's written on their website. They add beef flavoring to the frying oil. This may sound weird, but apparently, that's a known practice amongst chefs and restaurants. Duck fat has also been used as a flavor, for example, in high-end restaurants. I'm a fries lover, so I added another fact about fries. Sadly, they're even saltier than you think. Experts suggest that a grown-up should consume at most 2,300 milligrams of sodium daily. Guess the McD's large fry sodium number. At least 400 milligrams. Classic fries from Burger King have 732 milligrams. And Five Guys take the level even higher with 962 milligrams of sodium. Next time, maybe you can ask workers to go easy on the salt as a solution. Picture this. You're in a hurry, but your tummy says, feed me or I'll affect your mood and make life miserable for you. For a quick snack, you enter a fast food chain restaurant. You order your favorite burger. It looks and smells as if it's just been taken from the grill and served. Nope. They have different types of grills designed for this that can cook meat super quickly. Sorry to bear the bad news, but those perfect grill marks on your burger aren't real tools. The factory adds them. If you want to know how clean an eatery is, look under the ice chute of the soda machine in places where you can get your own drink. There you go, inspector. You solved the case. Various studies say that if such machines aren't cleaned correctly, dirty, contaminated ice can lead to some health problems. There could be mold or bacteria there. Ew! The process of cleaning ice machines isn't easy. The same thing applies to ice cream machines too. Rumor has it that those ice cream machines aren't out of order. Employers just cannot find time to clean them properly. Now, what's the best time to get a good and fresh meal? Here are two opinions, and they both have solid reasonings. The first team recommends avoiding ordering grilled food in chains from 7 to after midnight. Many former employees say that sometimes they had taquitos or hot dogs prepared at around 4 or 5 a.m., but kept waiting to serve them till around midnight. That's not healthy. The other team says you should order between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. or between 6 p.m. and 8 p.m. to get the freshest meal. Since it's going to be around lunch and dinner time, there'll be circulation and you can get decent food. Fast food companies have marketing, design, and psychological tricks to lure you in and make you order. Yet, they don't want you to stay inside for too long. If you were dining in mood lighting, you know under dim lamps and candlelight, you would take your time to eat. As the name suggests, you should be fast like your food in chain restaurants. They have fluorescence and they're in full light. Similarly, the floors and tables have reflective surfaces that make food look nice and bright. Plus, music is usually fast and loud. It's done to prevent you from spending hours there. Yet, they want you to take advantage of the first 20 minutes after your purchase. The faster you eat, the longer it will take you to feel full. Scientists say it takes about 20 minutes for our stomachs to inform our brain, okay, now I'm full. It's a good idea to eat in a clean area. 
but most of these companies are using cleaning products that have super strong chemicals. Assume that the staff clean the place at the end of their shift. They wipe down the soda machine and grill surface, and then you showed up early the next day. You may get some of that chemical residue on your food compared to other customers visiting the place later in the day. The vegan patty may not be 100% vegan. I'm talking about the grill, not the meat itself. In most of the chains, vegan burgers are cooked on the same grill as meat burgers. Do you have fast food chain secrets you want to share? Tell them to fellow Brightsiders in the comments. Wow, it's lunchtime. You choose a delicious looking piece of chicken, but oh no, it ends up on the floor instead of your mouth. You quickly pick it up and eat it anyway, because there is the five second rule, you know. The bad bacteria simply won't have enough time to hop on your food off the floor if you're fast enough. But is it real or is it just an urban legend? Some folks like to credit the famous Genghis Khan, the founder and ruler of the Mongol Empire, for the whole thing. According to the tale, if food fell on the floor at banquets, it was fair game as long as Khan said so. His food was supposedly so special that it was good for anyone, no matter where it landed. Back in the day, people didn't know much about those pesky microorganisms and how they could make us sick. So, eating dropped food wasn't really considered taboo. They figured if they wiped off the visible dirt, it was good to go. And that's how the con rule came to be. Hey, maybe they just had outstanding immune systems. Meanwhile, let's fast forward to the queen of culinary TV herself, Julia Child. As she whipped up mouth-watering meals on her show, The French Chef, some viewers claimed they saw her drop lamb, chicken, or even a turkey on the floor. But in reality, it was a potato pancake that landed on the stovetop, not the floor. In the spirit of having some fun in the kitchen, Julia famously said, But you can always pick it up, and if you are alone in the kitchen, who is going to see? And just like that, the misremembered story became part of popular culture. In real life, when your food hits the floor, it's like a bacteria magnet. That chicken piece is bound to pick up some unwanted microbial hitchhikers. You just can't give your fallen lunch a quick sanitizing session like you would with your hands. As for the 5 second rule, it's not all so simple. Some foods may have a better chance of survival after taking a tumble. Researchers from Rutgers University discovered that moisture, surface type, and contact time all play a role in the degree of cross-contamination. Foods with high moisture levels, like juicy watermelon, are the biggest culprits for contamination. That means they attract more bacteria than any other food tested. And not all environments and surfaces are created equal. Carpet had a low transfer rate in the experiment. Stainless steel and wood had higher transfer rates. In a different study, researchers swabbed the floors around the University of Illinois in the lab, hall, dormitory, and cafeteria to see how many organisms they could find. They were surprised to see very few microorganisms. It was probably because most malicious bacteria like Salmonella, Listeria, or E. coli can't survive without moisture, and the floors were all dry. But even on dry, sterile surfaces, germs relocated onto cookies and gummy bears in less than 5 seconds. For some foods, it takes less than 1 second for the transfer to begin. So the 5 second rule doesn't really rule, after all. It's more of an urban legend and a psychological trick your mind plays on you. Experimental psychologists explain that when it comes to decision-making, we humans don't always go through a rigorous risk-benefit analysis. Nah, we rely on our brain's trusty sidekicks called heuristics. These little shortcuts help us make lightning-fast decisions based on whatever info we've got at hand. Sometimes these shortcuts can lead us in the wrong direction, though, like in the case of germs. Those are invisible little troublemakers, and food is real and valuable. So when you drop a precious piece of food on the floor, say, a yellow peanut M&M, your brain goes like, hey, I can't see any germs, so it must be safe to snatch it up. <laughs> Not every floor snack will make you sick, but it also depends on you. Our immune systems, especially in the very young and the very old, can be a bit more fragile and vulnerable. So it's crucial not to pass on this questionable habit to the little ones. Remember, they're always watching! Another popular food-related myth 
is that carbs are always bad for you. In reality, some carbs are pretty important because they're converted into fuel for our bodies. You can find those complex carbs, as they're called, in plant-based foods. They're the ones that keep our digestive system happy and our metabolism in check. The real villains are the simple carbs. Manufacturers add them to processed foods like starches and sugars. When we gobble them up, they quickly turn into blood sugar, causing all sorts of havoc. Think sudden spikes, feeling hungry again in no time, and some more serious consequences for your health. The good carbs come packed with nutritional goodies, like fiber and bran, which makes them digest slower and release glucose gradually. To make smarter carb choices, try going for whole grain bread alternatives and swap soda for sparkling water. You can also try the plate method. Fill half your plate with fiber-rich, starch-free veggies. Reserve a quarter for starchy delights like potatoes or a fruity treat. And the last quarter is for proteins. Fish, poultry, beans, nuts, eggs, and lentils should become your new dietary besties. Now, frozen or canned fruits and veggies aren't useless like the rumor has it. Studies have shown that frozen, dried, juiced, or canned plant-based foods can be just as nutritious as their fresh counterparts. You just need to keep an eye out for any sneaky added ingredients like sugars, saturated fats, or sodium. High temperatures during the canning process can cause some vitamins, like C and B, to take a hit. But those vitamins can be a bit sensitive to heat and air in general, so they might leave even during regular cooking and storage at home. Some canned foods, like tomatoes and corn, actually release more antioxidants when they're heated up. Now, have you ever tried adding celery to your diet just because eating it is supposed to burn more calories than you take in? Experts say that negative calorie foods are nothing more than a fantastical idea. Sure, the process of munching and digesting celery burns a few calories, but not a significant amount. There may be around 10 calories in a hefty celery stick, but the body only uses one-fifth of that to process it. So it's still a calorie-plus situation. Plus, you'll unlikely survive just on celery, and it's often a gateway to more yummy foods like cream cheese or peanut butter. Hey, tell me about it. Meanwhile, high-fiber, water-dense fruits and veggies, like celery, can indeed have value as weight loss allies. They fill up your stomach and increase satiety, preventing you from gorging on more calories later. But they won't magically burn off the calories you've already consumed. Some people claim that certain foods or beverages make your body work harder. For example, your body needs to warm up cold water to a toasty 98 degrees Fahrenheit. But there's no solid research to support the idea that cold water drinkers burn significantly more calories. Maybe a measly 5 calories if you're lucky. Caffeine, guanine, taurine, and green tea extracts have been touted for their metabolism-boosting properties. But again, we're talking about a tiny boost that could potentially result in losing around 10 pounds over a year. So, looks like the best way to keep your calories under control is to consume fewer of them than you burn through exercise, not just digestion. Carbonated water isn't any worse than its still version. When carbon dioxide and water get together, they chemically react to create a weak acid called carbonic acid. It tickles the same nerve receptors in your mouth as mustard. That's why you get that delightful and prickly sensation. Although carbonated water is a bit acidic, drinking it won't make your entire body acidic. Your kidneys and lungs step in to remove any excess carbon dioxide from your system. And it's not terrible for your tooth enamel. One study found that sparkling mineral water had only a slight impact on enamel compared to still water. It was a whopping 100 times less damaging than a sugary soft drink. So keep your bubbly drink sugar-free, and you should be safe and healthy. Some of those potatoes you left in your pantry have turned green. Are they still safe to eat? When these vegetables come in contact with direct sunlight, they turn green because of a little thing called chlorophyll. It's a green pigment plants need to produce food during a process called photosynthesis. To prevent potatoes from turning green, you'll need to store them in a dark and well-ventilated area. While chlorophyll itself is harmless, once the amount of this substance increases in a potato, 
it triggers the appearance of another element called solanine. This is a substance found in tomatoes, eggplants, and most importantly, potatoes. Not only does it make these vegetables taste bitter, but it can also cause serious health problems, for example, related to digestion. Hmm. While it's best to refrain from eating green potatoes, you can always double-check if they are good to eat by tasting them. If you sense a taste of bitterness, it's best to throw them away. What about sprouted potatoes? Are they good to eat? Well, it depends. That substance solanine has a lot to do with it again. If a potato otherwise looks good and only has a couple of small sprouts, you can remove those and safely eat the vegetable. They won't be the best-looking potatoes, though. So if you want to cook a dish where you need neat vegetables, you might want to skip the slightly sprouted potatoes and use them for something else, like soups or mashed potatoes. But if your potato looks like it's grown arms and legs, <laughs> you'll be on the safe side if you throw it away. Solanine aside, it will also taste bitter, so you might end up cooking it for no good reason at all. Let's look at some other tips to help you improve your kitchen safety skills, like how you should wash fruits and vegetables with hard rinds, say melons or cucumbers. Simply running water over them may not be enough to get rid of all the nasty stuff on their surface. Best to use a sterilized scrub brush and some elbow grease to really get into those ridges and clean the vegetables properly. That way, the dirt and bacteria won't transfer from your veggies to your cutting knife or board. A fan of grilled meat? Might want to get a food thermometer to make sure you're always on the safe side. If you're an experienced cook, you might be able to visibly judge if the meat is ready. But if you're really not sure if the product is done, a thermometer will be your best friend. Specialists claim that whole cuts of meat need to reach a minimum internal temperature of 140 degrees Fahrenheit before you can serve them. Fish needs to reach 145 degrees, while ground meats need a minimum of 160. Poultry or pre-cooked meat, like hot dogs, need to be heated to at least 165 degrees. To safely store all the food you've bought for the rest of the week, you also need to make sure that your household devices are working properly and are set at the right temperatures, like your refrigerator temperature, for example, which should be at 40 degrees or lower. As for the temperature in the freezer, it should be 0 degrees Fahrenheit or lower. Now, that thermometer I mentioned earlier can be of use here, too, if you need to check whether your appliances are working properly. Luckily, most of these devices come equipped with their own thermometers these days. Do you need to bring your own food to your neighbor's barbecue party? Make sure to keep it cool on the way. Meat, poultry, and seafood need to be transported at 40 degrees Fahrenheit at most. You can always use an ice box. Just make sure to place its cooling parts in the freezer the night before. The way you organize food in your fridge can affect its quality, too. Raw meat, for example, needs to be stored on the bottom shelf of your fridge. It's also best to keep it away from fresh produce and ready-to-eat dishes. Now, have you experienced a long power outage recently? Sorry, but all the food in your fridge needs to go. If your fridge was offline for only a couple of minutes, you're most likely safe. Otherwise, you'll need to get rid of all the perishable foods. When it comes to canned food, you also need to take into consideration its acidity levels. Products that are high in acidity, like tomatoes, grapefruit, and pineapple, can be stored for 12 to 18 months if unopened. Canned vegetables, meat, poultry, and fish can be stored for longer, anywhere between 2 to 5 years, if the storing conditions are right and if the can itself remains undamaged. If anything looks rusty or has bumps on it, remove it from your pantry. You also need to be careful with storing your acidic food, as you should never use reactive pans. You might know that aluminum is used a lot in cookware because it's good at conducting heat. But cooking or storing something in an aluminum pan might not be so good for your food. Tomato sauce, for example, can damage aluminum or cast iron plates, and that will show in both the taste and the color of your food. Non-reactive pans are your safe bet, so make sure you invest in a good quality stainless steel, enamel-coated, or glass set of pans. A lot of dishes taste better if you pre-marinate the ingredients. 
Just make sure to always marinate food in the refrigerator. If you leave it outside on your counter, it'll soon reach room temperature, and then bacteria will start to multiply. And it may be dangerous if you don't cook that product at a high enough temperature afterward. Also, never reuse the marinating liquid. Now, the first rule, whenever you're gathering tools to prep for dinner, multiple cutting boards for each type of food. One should be reserved for meat and seafood, while others should be divided between vegetables, fruit, and baked goods. It's the best way to avoid cross-contamination in the kitchen. And speaking of cutting boards, your best bet would be to invest in a good bamboo one. This material absorbs little to no moisture and isn't easily damaged by knives. It's way more resistant to bacteria than any other type of wood, and it also lasts longer. Not to mention the fact that it also looks really cool. Eggs can cause a lot of trouble if not stored correctly, but here are a couple of tips you can use. Fresh eggs are safe to eat for up to three weeks after purchase. Keep them in their original carton. Hard-boiled eggs need to be consumed within the week, no matter if they still have their shells on or not. Lastly, if you keep leftover egg dishes in your fridge, make sure you eat them within three to four days. Now, we all want our batter to be smooth and free of lumps, don't you? But overmixing can be bad for your dish, too. Way too much elbow grease can cause gluten to form in the flour, which will give you a really tough batter. The trick is to mix lightly just until the batter is homogenous. Dried pasta comes in all sorts of different shapes and sizes for a reason, you know? That's because you should be pairing a specific type of pasta with the texture of the sauce. Like pasta shells, for example, go better with denser and chunkier sauces. Why? Because the sauce is gathered inside the shell, making it easier to serve and eat. The ribbed outside surface also helps with covering the shells and the sauce. Next time you mess up a tray of cookies and end up burning them, you can save them with your trusty grater. Just grate off the blackened parts from the bottom after carefully removing the cookies from the tray. Also, if you ruin their shape a bit, you can always dip them in melted chocolate. (laughs) After the chocolate gets a chance to cool down, you'll be left with perfectly shaped pastries. This creature first appeared on our planet around a billion years ago. It thrives in damp environments and can survive pretty much anywhere. It might be in your basement as we speak. I think you've already guessed I'm talking about mold here. It's a type of fungus that spreads through tiny particles moving through the air. These spores are like the seeds of a plant, although they're much smaller. Sometimes they cling onto clothes or animal fur and travel long distances unnoticed. They can survive even in some unfriendly environments and start growing when they land somewhere with enough water, food, and oxygen. Mold comes in all colors of the rainbow, and each color stands for a certain type of mold. You can usually find red or orange mold outdoors. The pink variety likes to reside in bathrooms on shampoo and soap residues. Black and green mold are the types you're most likely to meet in your house. Unlike plants that use photosynthesis, Mold grows on materials it can digest. Even one tiny mold spore is powerful enough to harm several people. But there are over 100,000 different types of mold in the world, and not all of them are dangerous to you. You just noticed something green on your sandwich, but only a small part of it is infected, so maybe you can just cut it off. Nope, it won't work out. The tiny greenish spots you see are on the surface, and you can spot them with the naked eye. But there's more hiding inside the bread. But if it was one second too late, and you've bitten into the bright green patch of mold, don't rush to the bathroom to scrub your tongue with antibacterial soap. You've probably eaten mold before without even knowing about it. It easily grows on soft, porous foods like bread, fruit, and vegetables. So, consuming just a bit of it is okay, as long as you have a strong immune system. You'll digest it like any normal food. If you feel sick after consuming it, that's most likely because mold tastes weird, and not because there's some vicious substance spreading through your body. So, the best you can do if you spot mold on your bread is not to risk your health and throw away the entire loaf. 
mold likes to settle in cooked leftovers like meat, poultry, casseroles, grain, pasta, cottage and cream cheese, yogurt, and sour cream. It's easier for mold to penetrate softer food, so it also loves fruits and vegetables like strawberries, cucumbers, peaches, and tomatoes. Jams and jellies are another easy target for mold, as it thrives in sweet and sugary foods. Yikes! Mold isn't always the bad guy ruining your lunch. You've got to thank it for that exquisite taste of blue cheeses, like gorgonzola, roquefort, and blue. Camembert and brie wouldn't be so delicious without the white mold on their surface. Cheese is 99.99% milk, and its makers grow mold either inside or outside the cheese, depending on its sort. But if you find mold on a cheese that shouldn't have it, like cheddar, parmesan, or Swiss, it means the molds added to any cheese to give it taste have come into contact with oxygen and started reproducing and breaking down fats and proteins uncontrollably. You should cut off the affected part carefully with a knife without touching the mold. The rest of the cheese is still good to eat. It would be impossible to produce soy sauce without fermenting soybeans, and it happens thanks to a certain type of fungi. Salami fans should appreciate mold for the unique flavor it gives to the meat and for preventing it from drying out too quickly. Mold has also saved millions of lives. Penicillium mold helped achieve a real breakthrough in medical science as it naturally produces the well-known penicillin, accidentally discovered by Scottish researcher Alexander Fleming in 1928. Some types of mold can also help you in the garden as a great mulch. Some gardening fans spend years trying to grow leaf mold to use for compost. They believe it improves soil quality. To prevent mold from overtaking your lunch, keep the food covered with plastic wrap in the fridge. Don't keep leftovers of perishable foods in their cans. Put them in airtight containers instead. Keep track of what you store in the fridge. Leftovers shouldn't be there for longer than three to four days. Keep your fridge clean. Only use fresh and clean dishcloths, towels, sponges, and mops. Once you notice a musty smell, it means mold is about to settle in your kitchen, and its plan is to contaminate your food. But what if mold spreads in the damp areas of your house? You might not notice any consequences for your health immediately, but they might resurface in the long term. As mold grows, its spores and fragments can produce irritants in the air inside your house. Depending on how sensitive you are, you might notice it's becoming hard to breathe. And since mold slowly but surely breaks materials in your house, there will be more dust and other particles in the air. When you try to get rid of the bad mold in your house, you might accidentally touch it without any protection. It won't take your life, but don't let it sit on your hands. First off, clean your hands well with antibacterial soap. Clean between your fingers and the back of each hand thoroughly, and also scrub underneath the nails. If you can't reach some spores, use a toothpick. Then, clean your hands with a strong sanitizer. The final step will be to wash your hands with liquid soap under running water. Again, don't miss the areas between your fingers and under your nails. Don't touch your face until your hands are perfectly clean. You don't want to accidentally inhale those spores. You should also take off the clothes you were wearing when you came into contact with mold and wash it immediately. It's impossible to mold-proof your home, but you can make it resistant to that mean intruder. Inspect your house and find the problem areas. It could be a flood in your basement, a water stain on the ceiling, or a window that's always covered with condensation. Fix those problems and install proper ventilation in the house. AC units and dehumidifiers will help. Open a window while cooking or showering to keep the moisture outside. Make sure your roof gutters are regularly cleaned and fixed. Invest in a moisture meter and monitor the humidity inside. Ideally, it should be between 30 and 60 percent. Always remove wet clothes from the washing machine unless you want to share your garments with mold. The best you can do is hang them to dry outside in fresh air and wait while they get completely dry before putting them in your wardrobe. Empty and air out drawers and closets you rarely open every now and then. 
Never leave the bathroom floor and walls wet after you take a shower. And clean your house regularly. Then nasty mold won't have a chance. The moist soil in your house plants is every mold's dream. To save them, don't overwater them and let fresh air circulate in the room where your plants live. If you see mold is starting to grow on your plants, mix two tablespoons of white vinegar and some water in a spray bottle and apply the mix to your plants. You can also do the same thing using a tablespoon of baking soda. There's a common myth that bleach can help you get rid of mold. In reality, it will only help you remove the visible part, but the spores will survive and keep spreading. Depending on what you do for a living, you may also meet mold in your workplace. Poorly ventilated spaces, greenhouses, farms, and even bookstores and libraries are in the risk zone here. Paper contains cellulose, and it's a perfect food source for some types of mold. Old books that have been stored in a humid room for many years could be hiding millions of mold spores. The rules to protect yourself in a workspace are pretty much the same as for your house. Clean it regularly, dry damp surfaces, and if it's impossible, wear protective gloves when you have to come into contact with mold. Everyone has their own morning rituals to cheer the body up after sleep. Apart from exercising and hot showers, the first food that you put into your hungry tummy can define the rest of the day. That's why it's good to know which foods are just not meant to be eaten on an empty stomach. Well, at least we have bananas. This fruit is a great choice for a lazy breakfast, right? Wrong! No matter how fresh and healthy it is, raw bananas can bring chaos to your stomach if you eat them at the wrong time. This fruit is rich in magnesium, which may lead to digestive issues. Also, in some cases, it can cause blood pressure fluctuations. But if you're still a dedicated banana eater, try mixing it with oatmeal. It creates a lining in the stomach that prevents irritation caused by the naturally produced hydrochloric acid. Bananas go well with other healthy foods like porridge, peanut butter, dried fruits, or nuts for eating early in the morning. What could be better than a fresh, crispy croissant for breakfast? Many things, actually. Cakes, pastries, pizza, and other bakeries usually contain yeast, which can harm the stomach lining if eaten on an empty stomach. Also, bakery products may cause flatulence, so it's not the best food you want to eat first thing in the morning. But you can replace the regular white yeast bakery with sourdough whole grain bread. In fact, it's one of the best food choices right after waking up. This bread is rich in carbohydrates that are very important for a balanced diet and keeping your gut bacteria happy. A glass of fresh citrus juice looks very Instagram friendly when standing on a fancy breakfast tray. But unfortunately, things don't look so glamorous inside your stomach. Fruit smoothies and juices are too rich in fructose, which may shock and overburden your sleepy pancreas and liver. Although they are great any time of the day, in the morning, citrus fruits should be consumed after eating something else. Otherwise, they may cause great harm to the body. The high content of fructose and fiber can make your metabolism work lazier during the day. And also, experts mm. don't recommend eating more than two oranges per day to avoid hurricanes in your tummy. If you can't imagine your morning without fruits, go for papaya or watermelon. They can help flush toxins out of your body and make you feel lighter during the day. Fresh salads are very good in most cases, but still, experts advised against eating raw vegetables on an empty stomach. After a long hour fasting, your tummy may find it too hard to digest the coarse fibers. So if you don't want to experience pain and discomfort, keep your salad for later hours. Let's talk about the hot water in the morning trend. You've probably seen a bulk of its variations. Bloggers suggest mixing the water with all sorts of things, from lemon juice and chia seeds to baking soda. Of course, each of these magic potions requires separate research and scientific approval. But most experts agree that one glass of pure lukewarm water in the morning is a great tool to inspire your bowel movement and prepare it for the day. On the other hand, it's not advised to drink cold beverages if your stomach is empty because they can damage the mucous membrane. This can make your digestive system work lazier or in some cases cause discomfort and an upset stomach. 
When it comes to your morning coffee, the rule is simple. If you want to stay healthy, never drink coffee on an empty stomach. When you do so, it stimulates the secretion of hydrochloric acid, which is harmful to your digestive system. Not only can it provoke gastritis from time to time, but also develop many health issues in the long term. Also, coffee boosts the level of cortisol, the hormone which controls our biological clock. It happens very quickly, and the body needs to make an extra effort to balance the things back to a normal state. That's why experts recommend drinking coffee an hour after waking up, but you should eat something beforehand. Even a tiny slice of bread will be fine. If you like eating yogurt with granola or any other fermented milk products for breakfast, make sure to eat something safe before them. Ideally, you have to wait about an hour. Otherwise, dairy products can damage the good bacteria in your stomach and cause the effect opposite to what they're actually made for. But this recommendation doesn't apply to cheeses. If you want your digestive system to thank you, go for feta or cottage cheese. These good fats are just perfect for the morning. Goat cheese is also a nice idea. It's softer and tangier than most cow cheeses. And it also tends to be slightly higher in fat and minerals and lower in lactose. Many people eat chocolate or protein bars for breakfast. But in fact, processed sugar is the champion among the worst breakfast choices. Any high sugar food and drink should be avoided just after waking up in the morning. But don't rush off to cut off the chocolate completely. It can help chase away the morning gloom and improve your mood during the day. Chocolate can promote positive feelings because it stimulates the production of hormones responsible for our good mood. That's why a reasonable amount of high quality chocolate after breakfast can be beneficial for your well being and help you switch to work mode. Keep in mind that darker chocolate contains more caffeine, while white chocolate has none. So, if you want to stay alert, go for 70% dark chocolate. Not only does it help you stay wakeful, but it's also a treasury of useful components like calcium, copper, potassium, antioxidants, and magnesium. Chili with jalapenos might taste delicious, but it's not the best choice for breakfast. Here's why. When you eat spicy food on an empty stomach, it irritates your vulnerable lining and makes your belly very unhappy. So, if you don't want to risk suffering from an irritated stomach throughout the day, it makes sense to keep the chili for dinner. It may seem like all foods are bad on an empty stomach, but that's not the case. In fact, we have plenty of safe and healthy breakfast options that will help improve the functioning of your body. Take nuts, for example. These tiny power banks are rich in vitamins, minerals, proteins, and good omega 3 fatty acids. So, eating them first in the morning can be very nutritious. They'll keep you feeling energized during the day and help fight overeating habits. Also, nut consumption can help maintain the pH balance in the stomach. But, of course, moderation is crucial because nuts are very fatty. Experts advise eating just one handful per day, which is approximately two tablespoons. Some recommend soaking nuts in water overnight to make them even more beneficial and easier to digest. The same technique works for dates, raisins, and other dried fruits and berries. If you're both worried about your weight and health, the perfect choice for breakfast is eggs. They can give a feeling of fullness without heaviness, which helps to control appetite during the day. They're also rich in proteins and low in calories. Just a couple of tablespoons of wheat germs before breakfast will provide you with a bunch of vitamins and folic acid. This superfood contains dietary fiber that helps your digestive system work smoothly. It's also reported to have some anti aging properties. Here's another well known superfood that can give you both a good mood and better digestion chia seeds. They're even more beneficial when consumed on an empty stomach. It's up to you whether to take them directly or along with water. When you consume honey after waking up, it can gently add some inspiration to a lazy bowel. Also, honey can boost the production of serotonin to help you feel good during the day. But first, make sure you're not allergic to honey. Today, we're going to reveal some fast food secrets. 
By now, we've all learned that we never get the exact same food that we see in ads. But uh, there is way more stuff to know about how fast food companies make us buy stuff. It's like they make your brain order, Ooh, I've seen something delicious! Get that for me ASAP! Ooh! Well, imagine entering a food court and smelling all that beautiful food. As you walk by, one smell stands out from the others. Fresh baked Cinnabon. Yeah, they do bake them. But the smell that reaches your nose doesn't come straight from the oven. Cinnabon bakery chains place their ovens near their front door to attract customers. That smell isn't just coming from the oven, though. The staff heats baking sheets with sprinkled cinnamon and brown sugar to keep the sweet aroma in the air all day long. These smells make you feel hungry, even though your stomach isn't empty. Let me introduce you to aroma marketing. The aim here is to make products irresistible. Did you notice the unique scent of crispy fries from McDonald's? It's the same smell in all stores worldwide. This is a pre-planned strategy. You smell these aromas, and your body increases ghrelin production. Ghrelin is the hunger hormone, by the way. Your stomach produces it. So yeah, these smells can stimulate your appetite. Another strategy to lure customers is to use the power of colors. They also trigger your appetite. Think about the most famous fast food restaurant logos and the colors used inside and in their branding. Slogans, mascots, or meals can change, but nearly all well-known fast food chains go with a similar color palette. There's no coincidence. Research proves that these warm colors activate your hunger. Also, they grab your attention. Think about it as a traffic light or a stop sign. You kind of want to stop. Now, in the past, people burned many calories to find food. Are you going to hunt some animals and gather some herbs? No. You just need to walk into a cafe around the corner to get your food in 5 minutes. Since this food is not expensive and is served fast, your brain's reward system favors it. Convenience is also addictive, like sugar. Brands are aware of this, and this leads us to the next fact. Businesses know how our brains work and manipulate them. If you're asked if you want to have a larger size of fries or drink, it's likely you'll say yes. Every brand earns millions of dollars just by upsizing the menus, for instance. Upsizing costs less, but oops, you've actually just spent more than you intended. The pricing format and dollar menu are also a part of this trick. You see numbers advertised as only $5.89. It's almost 6, but your brain associates it with the number 5 because you see 5 written there, not 6. Plus, the currency signs are sometimes small and hard to read. You go for a a la carte option, but they're placed on the sides and extra value meals flash out. When you look at the prices, a place in your brain called the orbitofrontal cortex takes control. Research shows that when a person buys something, knowing there's a better deal among the options, the brain activity shows signs of pain. There's a good offer, but if you take it, you end up eating more. Maybe you only want to buy a burger and you end up with fries and a drink. On the other hand, it's good if that was your intention all along. I can't argue with that. Do you know that your burgers are wrapped in grease-repelling paper? This means that this paper might contain harmful chemicals. Researchers tested samples taken from 400 containers and wrappers from fast food chains. They discovered that 38% of sandwich and burger wrappers contain fluorine, a rather toxic substance. And it's not just sandwich and burger wrappers. They found that 56% of dessert and bread wrappers and 20% of french fry sleeves contain fluorine. So, sadly, not just fast food, but also its packaging can be harmful. Now here's another trick. When you're on your way to get a snack from the drive-thru, the machines will recognize your license plate, and based on your previous purchases, they will flash similar options in front of you. Another thing about drive-thrus is that they place cameras there. Sometimes you just talk through the buzzer. You can't see the staff, but beware, they can see you in some chains. Those use devices like magnetic sensors to notice vehicles. Then employees get notified via their headsets. They press a special button to activate their mics. Without sensors, cameras, and windows, how could they see you coming? They aren't psychic. Don't worry much, though. Employees probably don't care what you do. I mean, they have a million other things to do instead. 
Now, let's assume you get a burger from the drive-thru. You have grilled meat in it. Wait a minute, is it really grilled? Shocking news, they add a solution, sort of a sauce with a grilled flavor to the meat and make those fake grill lines on it. They can't grill meat at such short notice, but people like this look, so they go with this option. Speaking of faking it, fast food is very processed. I mean, the flavor in the burgers and nuggets is often gone in the process level of process. To compensate for this, companies add special chemicals to give the food taste and aroma. Now earlier, we talked about the tricks companies use in drive throughs It's time to reveal the secrets of self-serve kiosks. You tend to spend more when you order your food via these kiosks. Restaurants expect that you'll spend about 20% more. The system in these kiosks is designed to upsell. Cashiers ask you questions, but while using a self-service kiosk, you don't feel rushed or maybe judged for your orders and choices. A lawsuit was filed in the U.S. about one fast food chain's tuna sandwich. It turns out that the ingredient advertised as tuna had no tuna in it. This was concluded by tests run in independent labs with multiple samples taken from this chain in California. The fast food chain said the claims didn't reflect the truth. So we'll just wait and see. A fact about nuggets is here, and it's proven. This one might be hard to digest, but they often don't contain chicken. Hmm. Scientists have tested them, and what they found is often only 50% meat. Apparently, there's a thing, sort of a process, called mechanically separated meat. And the remaining product comes from there. Fancy eating a blizzard cone or parfait from DQ? No one can stop you, but you should know that technically, what you're eating isn't ice cream. Dairy Queen Soft Serve has 5% milk fat. The FDA says that a product has to have at least 10% of milk fat to be considered ice cream. But the company isn't keeping this fact to itself. It's written on its website. Now, what about discount coupons or free products? It's all part of the plan. Some people go to restaurants with coupons. They think, I might also get this or that since I'm already here. Most of them buy something else. And the item they buy is often more expensive than the free item on their coupon. Now, sometimes people want to go with healthier options in fast food chains. They might miss the point that healthy might not be healthy at the end of the day if the person orders a sauce chicken salad. They might end up having more calories than they would get from a burger. On top of this, healthier options often cost more in comparison to regular items. Anyway, this is an ever-lengthening list. After all, the fast food industry is huge. We're talking billions of dollars. Maybe that's why it comes with a lot of secrets behind the scenes. Hmm, we've been talking about all this, and now I want to order a burger. You just woke up a little drowsy from too much sleep. You arrive at the kitchen, and your stomach growls. Time for breakfast, you think immediately. You open your cupboard and take out that yummy cereal you bought yesterday. What follows is automatic. You grab a bowl, pour the cereal, and then that delicious milk on top of it. Just like in the ads. But wait. Oh no, there's milk all over the counter. Again! Tell me, has this ever happened to you? Several times? That's what I thought. Well, dear ones, I'm sorry to inform you that you've been eating not only your cereal, but many other delicious breakfast platters wrong your entire life. Now, back to cereals for a moment. Did you know that there is a way you can avoid that messy milk all over your counter? Next time you wake up hungry for some breakfast cereal, I suggest you do the following. Pour some cereal into a bowl. Then grab a spoon and rotate it so that the curvy part is facing upwards. Now grab the creamy milk you love so much and pour the milk on top of the spoon. There you go. No more mess. You see? Now, if you're asking yourself what this upside-down spoon serves for, I'll let you in on a little secret. The reason why your milk splashes all over the place when you pour it directly on top of your cereal is usually because of those rounded edges of the flake. They make the milk bounce on top of them and spill directly onto your counter. And since we're speaking of cereals, let's talk crunchiness. Did you know that there's a very dedicated strand of science that studies the so-called perfect crunch? I mean, there are scientists that spend their entire days analyzing how to create the perfect flake in order to optimize crunchiness. 
These people know that you got to love every single bite of cereal from the start, so they study how to make that possible. Well, usually, the problem with cereal crunchiness is how to figure out the flakes-milk ratio. That is, how much milk you should pour for your cereal to remain crunchy. Now, try this. Instead of pouring all your cereal and milk at the same time, pour a little bit of cereal, cover it with milk, and let it sit for a while. You can mix them both together with a spoon to make sure all the flakes are bathed in milk. Then, pour an extra layer of cereal on top of that, and voila, it's ready. This way, you can experience what cereal scientists call dynamic contrast, which basically means you get a perfect combination of textures in one bite. Can you taste that already? You'll get the soggy flakes together with the super crunchy ones. Believe me, your taste buds will thank you for that. Now, bananas. Did you know you've been peeling them the wrong way your entire life? You should eat your bananas like monkeys do. You heard it right. Chimpanzees, gorillas, and all existing species from the monkey family peel their bananas upside down. They grab the fruit, turn it so that the stem is on the bottom, and peel the banana from the other end. Eating your banana this way prevents you from eating the mushy part full of strings. Do you sometimes wake up craving oranges like me? Your body needs that daily amount of vitamin C to boost the immune system. But oranges are such a tricky fruit to peel. And so I end up with orange juice sprayed all over my face, making me give up halfway through. Now try this. Next time you peel an orange, start by cutting off both ends of the fruit. Cut the peel vertically from one end to the other. Then, hook a finger into each side of the cut and open your orange. Behold, the orange will unfold before you like a map, with all those juicy wedges ready to be eaten and appreciated. Yummy! And oh, since we're talking about oranges, do you happen to know the correct way to pour your orange juice? According to several studies, when pouring orange juice from the carton, people automatically place the plastic spout in direct contact with their glass. What follows is the pleasant sound we associate with morning pours. Glug, glug, glug. Yeah, I know, I'm good at making funny noises. Jokes aside, even if this type of pouring sounds amazing, it's exactly what causes the splashing of juice all over the place. And here comes the science. The inside of a juice carton has the same atmospheric pressure as the outside. When we pour with the spout close to our glass or mug, it's the own weight of the liquid that pushes itself out of the carton. As you already know, the liquid comes out all wobbly and unstable, generating big waves of juice inside your glass and inevitably splashing outside the cup. So, in order to avoid a big mess, you should invert the position of the spout, twisting the carton so that the spout is as far away as possible from the rim of your cup. When you pour it this way, the small hole on the spout helps to regulate air pressure, letting air flow in and out, making the juice pressure remain neutral, and creating the perfect pour of juice. Neat, right? Still on the topic of fruits, how do you eat your apples? If you're doing it the traditional way, it actually means you're wasting up to 30% of your fruit. By the traditional way, I mean eating them from the sides up until the core. Well, according to apple science, we end up leaving a reasonable amount of core that will be thrown directly into the trash. So, to optimize your apple eating, try biting it from either the top or the bottom, spitting out the seeds as they come along. This way, I guarantee you'll be eating your apple effectively and with minimum waste. Now, now, what are these beautiful peaches doing here? There are many ways to eat them, and a lot of people adopted peaches as a must on their fruit bowls, or eat it simply by taking a bite out of its succulent core. But for some people, the fuzzy texture that envelopes peaches are something that they really can't get past. There's an easy way of peeling peaches called blanching, and to do it, you'll need nothing more than water and your bare hands. First, heat up some water, let it almost get to the point of boiling, and then turn it off. Then, soak the peaches in hot water and leave them there for no more than 20 seconds. Got that covered? Alright, let's move on. Move the peaches to another bowl, 
but this time, make sure the water inside of it is cold. Leave the peaches there for about five minutes. The end result is skin ready to be easily peeled. Isn't that amazing? And what about juicy kiwis? I'm sure we all try to peel the outside skin with a knife, cutting off huge chunks of the inside as well. Next time, try cutting the bottom and upper parts, grabbing a spoon, and eating the inside of the kiwi like you're eating ice cream. Then there's mango. Don't cut the peel off so then you can eat it. Try cutting the mango on both sides of the seed. Then grab an empty glass and slide the pieces of mango on the glass using it as a knife. This way, all of the insides of the fruit will drop into your glass, and you'll have literally a glass half full of delicious fruit. Since we've covered fruits, let's bring pancakes and bacon. Maybe the best pancake you ever had is a recipe that has run in your family for generations. But try this one. First, let's talk about the shape. We eat with our eyes as well as our mouths, so no slashing your pancake mix randomly on your pan or cooking device. A simple trick you can use to make perfectly shaped pancakes is transferring the mix to an empty ketchup container. Do remember to clean it first, though. So the magic goes: squeeze the mix from a ketchup bottle on top of your heated pan, and add the pre-cooked bacon on top of the pancake mix. If you're feeling like going the extra mile, pour some more dough on top of the bacon. This way, you not only have the perfect pancake, but the perfect pancake sandwich for breakfast. Now that's really something. Well, do try all or some of these suggestions out, and then tell us if they worked for you. And remember, always stay on the bright side of life. Picture this: it's a cloudy, misty morning in the middle of winter. Tom wakes up, a bit nervous for the day ahead. He's leaving on a long journey through uncharted waters. His captain says they will try to leave England and make it all the way to the Americas. He's ready and packed to leave his house when his wife reminds him to take the biscuits he had spent the night preparing. Let's zoom in on these biscuits right here. They look a bit strange, don't they? These are called ship's biscuits, and they were literally the biscuits that sailors ate during long voyages at sea. A ship's biscuit could go years without going bad. I know that sounds impossible, but the secret is in the ingredients and baking methods. When sailors departed, they didn't know how long they would go without setting foot on land again, so they needed to be ready, food-wise. Otherwise, they could perish from extreme hunger. So bakers came up with this simple biscuit. It's mostly made out of three ingredients: salt, flour, and a bit of water. The idea is that the dough stayed as stiff as it could. Then, bakers would put them in the oven for hours at very low temperatures. The purpose of this slow baking was to take off all the moisture in the biscuits. Even if you're not an experienced sailor, you might suspect that moisture is the enemy of food preservation. It makes stuff get moldy and attracts insects and other animals. Plus, a ship is already an extremely moist environment, so the biscuits had to go on the countercurrent of all of that. A ship's biscuit can go six, seven, eight years without going bad. The little holes you see on them help to get the moisture out during the cooking process. A sailor like Tom, medium-sized, would get a portion of six to eight ship's biscuits per day. They were extremely nutritious and satiated a person's hunger. Now, this was a type of survival food. It wasn't meant to be super pleasurable, yummy, or even give you all the nutrients you needed. Just the basics. Now, do you have any idea what life was like in the 18th century? If you think about a city like New York, there were only about 18,000 people living there. For comparison, today the city hosts more than 8 million people. Back then, if someone had to travel from New York to Boston, there wouldn't be any of the convenience stores there were along the way. I mean, there weren't even roads as we know them now. So, people needed to make food provisions, and this is where portable soup came in handy. If you imagined a boiling pot of meat and veggies, I'm sorry to inform you, you are wrong. Portable soup is hard and condensed. It looks like this. Portable soup is a type of solidified broth, a very, very condensed substance made essentially of meat. Think about it. It's convenient. It's light. It doesn't take up much space, but it's extremely hard to make. The best meat to make portable soup is one with a lot of collagen, like beef shank, and the secret is slow cooking. 
You can't lose sight of it though, because if it boils up, you ruin the whole thing. While cooking the meat, it will release its taste in the water in the pot, and after a few hours, it's safe to take the beef out. The remaining water will be rich in nutrients and fats, and once you reduce that down for about 18 to 24 hours, you'll get a gelatine-like nutritional substance. Once this cools down, it turns into a tablet of sorts. It's pretty amazing to witness the entire transformation process, but hey, this dark tablet is really satiable. And to eat it, you just needed to find some hot water and put the meat tablet inside of it. It would release all the condensed nutrients in it, giving you a warm, hearty meal. Here's a trick question for you. Do you know why hamburgers are called hamburgers if they are not made out of ham? Apparently, it has to do with the city they were first invented in, the city of Hamburg in Germany. But it wasn't what we are used to today. I mean, they didn't even use ketchup. Well, at least not the tomato ketchup we use now. But did you know that other types of ketchup have existed throughout history? As weird as it may sound, back in the 18th century, people ate mushroom ketchup. For your information, if you look up ketchup in some dictionaries, it is by definition a sauce made out of mushrooms. It has nothing to do with tomatoes. I wonder where people got that idea from. Anyways, to make it, you can use any type of mushrooms. Even shiitake if you're feeling fancy. The idea is to smash them, cook them, and add a bunch of spices to the mix. I'm talking clove, nutmeg, ginger, pepper, and whatever else your palate wishes for. And in case you're wondering what our ancestors ate it with, I have one word for you, meat. They would pour mushroom ketchup over a nice piece of steak, for example, like a gravy sauce or something like it. Now, if this just left your mouth full of water, I have good news. You can still find mushroom ketchup in Great Britain. It's just North America that kind of forgot it. Neat, huh? And what did people eat back in the day when they were feeling unwell? Today, we have a concept of food I particularly love, comfort food, which is something to eat when you are feeling down and sad. But then, on the days you're feeling sick, what do you eat? I immediately think of a warm soup or something nutritious and light. Our forefathers drank something called posset. Now, posset could be described as an eggnog with some sweets added into it. Its recipe can be traced down to as early as the 15th century. The drink was considered such a reliable remedy that Shakespeare even used it as a poison in Macbeth. Here's another quick pop quiz for you. Why do we say the proof is in the pudding? This famous expression simply means that you'll only know the true value of something once you experience it for yourself. The expression started to be used back in the 1600s, but there's an important thing to note here. In Britain, pudding is not the sweet desert known by many in America. Rather, it's a savory dish, much like a pie. I guess it's safe to say that the British are good at turning almost anything into pie. From apple pie to pumpkin pie, chicken pot pie, and so on. Now, in the 18th century, they had something called beefsteak pie. This was an incredibly popular dish back then, but somewhere along the way, we lost the habit of making it. Sure, you can find steak and kidney pudding today, but it's got all sorts of stuff in it, such as potatoes, carrots, and thick gravy. Up until the 19th century, people ate the stripped down version of this dish, which was basically made out of richly flavored meat. They say breakfast is the most important meal of the day. If you're in the US, you might eat some avocado on toast or a rich bowl of cereal. If you're in Vietnam, you might enjoy a warm bowl of broth soup or rice. But if you were eating breakfast in 18th century England or even the United States, you would get something like this. This is the old school version of what we know as bacon and eggs. Except that, uh, that, that back then, it was called collops and eggs. According to the traditional Hannah Glass recipe, straight from the most famous cookbooks of back then, the egg wasn't fried or boiled, it was poached, and the bacon was probably not as processed as we eat them today. A little toast was added on the side, and there you had it, the perfect start for a long day.